or a heterozygous mix, or you could have little b, little b. And um, in typical RNA-seq uh, or expression analyses, we don't really, uh, we don't care which um, allele of the gene is being expressed. We just count from either allele. Um, and, um, but there are reasons why it's interesting to look at the um, expression of the two alleles. So um, here I'm using some language, um, some, so um, I'm just, I'm showing this gene now and along the genome and uh, let's say upstream of the gene is a, a SNP or variant or could be even a copy number variant, um, which is somehow regulatory for the gene. And so sometimes that's called a, like an R SNP or a regulatory SNP. And then um, inside of the gene, there could be another SNP, which is called like a transcribed SNP or an eSNP. And um, it could be interesting to you know, take into account which um, which allele the uh, is being expressed. So um, if this is a regulatory SNP for this um, gene, if you look across, um, you know, from uh, the homozygous to the heterozygous and then the homozygous of the alternate allele, if you see a change in the number of, um, of transcripts, that's indicating that that is an EQTL, an expression quantitative trait locus, like this, that the pair of the SNP and the gene it describes a locus. And that might tell you about what that SNP is doing. So it's Im important for understanding non-coding genetic variation. And if you look across these different types of individuals and you see a change, that's called um, an EQTL. You can also see that within this middle group. So within a heterozygous individual, you can count the difference between the two alleles if you can observe it. So this is a little diagram. This on the on the y-axis is whether there is allelic imbalance. And so on the top two panels, um, there is no allelic imbalance, right? So you can see the number of reads are the same, and that's because there's no genetic variation in this like regulatory element here. And so in both cases, it's the same. And on the bottom, there's some allelic imbalance because Let's say this SNP, this like little blue uh, uh, brown line, is somehow disrupting the binding of this yellow transcription factor. So then there's less of the transcription. So on the bottom two diagrams, there is allelic imbalance in the system. And you know, there's true biological allelic imbalance. And then left to right is whether there's a SNP inside the transcribed region. So this T SNP. And um, that's whether we can observe the allelic imbalance. So we need to, there needs to be genetic variation in the coding, uh, in the um, transcribed region. Um, it doesn't have to be in the coding region. It could be in, in the UTR. Um, but uh, if there is genetic variation there, we can see it. And if there's both genetic variation in the regulatory regions and genetic variation in the, um, in the transcribed region, then we can detect an imbalance. So I hope that diagram is not too complicated. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that it is a, a context specific um, property. So it's not that within an individual, there will always be allelic imbalance, but it actually differs by over time and by cell type. So um, this is a, a diagram showing, like, depending on what elements are accessible, so their epigenetic state, and depending on what transcription factors happen to be in the nucleus, you might or you might see or not see allelic imbalance. And this is, um, we'll see this today, so we'll see an example of dynamic allelic imbalance. And then um, another member of the la of the Lub Lab, Wen Sun Mu. Um, um, worked on a package to detect allelic imbalance across cell types in single cell um, data. Let's see. I'm just going to, um, I see a question from Ryan. If you see allelic imbalance, it could be explained by an EQTL, but also by something like splicing QTL. Yes. So I'm giving a super quick intro to allelic imbalance, and um, we're going to kind of focus on this kind of regulatory region type of um, of uh, imbalance, but in the text uh, introduction of this workshop, 
we talk about there's a bunch of other things that could be going on, like imprinting or splicing QTLs. Um, and so we're kind of, I, I'm just showing a cartoon, but there there's all these other interesting things that you can detect, and those are kind of covered in the text. Um, so why do we have this, why, why a workshop today? There are many workflows for detecting allelic imbalance, and um, they have lots of advantages. And so a very popular one is called WASP. And um, often allelic imbalance is considered at the SNP level or at the gene level, and it does not account for isoforms at all. So it just, it just looks to see if there's a stack of reads at a SNP um, and, and if those are imbalanced. And there's, you know, so there, there are a number of advantages of that approach, but one that we, uh, a disadvantage that we focused on is that there could be, um, there could be um, across the two alleles, um, different imbalance for different promoters. And that's kind of what we're gonna focus on today. So for example, here, there's a SNP here, which is producing less expression of this promoter of, of you know transcripts starting at that promoter and then suppose this um variant on the other allele on the other chromosome is producing less expression for transcripts from that promoter and these dotted lines would represent like chromatin contacts so maybe you know this is some complex looping thing here but um we do see these examples and we wanted to be able to observe um this isoform level regulation as well as um the gene level so um, let's see, coming up, coming up on like nine minutes. Um, our input for like what 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 type of data do we need to run this? Um, oh, and then let me just try to respond to that. Oh, uh, that, so Ryan asked a question about those are yeah these are alternative promoters like for the same gene, um, and this we see this happening in real data. So that's kind of what we're focused on. We, we want to be able to detect that as well as gene level. Um, imbalance. So we're going to assume that there are RNA seq reads, um, and we're kind of focusing on genes where there's some heterozygosity. So we need actually we need to have measured. Um, there needs to be a heterozygous SNP in the code in the transcribed region of the gene, or else we just don't see the imbalance. There could be imbalance, but we're stuck with the total count. Um, we don't we can't disambiguate from the reads. And so um, our pipeline that we've worked on um, with a number of collaborators, I'll, I'll have a slide that acknowledges all the collaborators in a minute. Um, you start with a, a FASTA um, for the genome and a, like a, a strain specific VCF. So we've done a lot of work with uh, model organisms and F1 crosses. Um, I'll mention that if, you're, if you wanna do human allelic imbalance, we are very interested to support that, but right now our pipeline is really for um, when uh, um, isogenic. So all the samples are from the same um, the same F1, or or it could be a heterozygous human donor, but you're kind of doing something over time in a, in a single donor. We're working on um, generalizing this. So you start with this FASTA and and VCF. And you build a diploid transcript sequence using this tool called G2G tools from the Churchill lab. Um, and then you take your RNA-seq reads and you quantify allelic expression against a 2N transcriptome. So it's got two versions of every transcript. And you, we here we're using salmon to quantify um, expression of the two alleles. And you also generate um, bootstrap distributions for the um, allelic data. We import to R with a new function in the fish pond package called import allelic counts. Um, and then we do differential analysis, which we'll see today. So just I want to pause and acknowledge um, a lot of people we've been working on with this project, including a team um, that's for the real data analysis, this um, mouse osteoblast data set. Um, we've done methods development with Rob Patro's group, including Noor, who's here today, and Mosin. Um, and um, um, Biostat's uh, mentorship and community at UNC and the financial support. Okay, so I'm gonna um, off from the slides and switch over to the um, 
to this pipeline. And I'm going to go fast because um, I went slower than I thought on the slides. Um, so let me just zoom in real quick and then I'll hand off soon. So there's a lot of text above, which is kind of redundant with what I just was talking about. Um, and then I'm jumping in here at when we're talking about how to import this data. So we've quantified with salmon to the two alleles of the organism, and we have bootstrap data that tells us about the uncertainty. Um, so now we um, we create um, transcripts from some transcript database. We assume we have all these different um, um, samples, and then we we basically import the data. And there's an option about how what level of analysis do you want to do the um, allelic comparisons. So you can do it at the gene level. That's kind of we we've done that, and it, it gives you very similar results to WASP. Um, or you can also do it at like a sub gene resolution, and so you can do it at the isoform level. But we found that it's preferable to do it at the transcript start site level. That you can find interesting things, um, and the way you do that is you just we've we've added a function that helps you like group isoforms by their transcription start site and also we have like a little wiggle parameter like plus or minus 50 base pairs we group those together because we're interested in potential um imbalance that's affecting um like specific promoter regions so after doing this um this kind of um, grouping of the isoforms to the tss level you import the data um, using this new function called import allele accounts, and it'll build a, um, a what we call a wide summarized experiment. It's wide because it has uh, first samples and their um, like reference allele, and then come the alternative allele. So it's it's double wide compared to a normal summarized experiment. Um, and then the last thing before I pass off to Yufi, I just want to very quickly describe the data set we're looking at. So it's a really cool data set from our collaborators. Um, so Cheryl and Gary, uh, um, who are um, who, among other things, are mouse geneticists. And Cheryl is also Cheryl Ackard Bicknell is also a, um, a studies osteoblast, so the bo bone um, cell cells that generate the bone density and the matrix in the bone. And this is a a differentiation time course where they start with um, uh, pr uh, precursor cells to the mature adipus, uh, to the mature osteoblasts, and then they differentiate them over 18 days. So we have nine time points of an F1 mouse, and we can track how the two alleles for every gene, um, how they track over time. And this is um, so. We're going to release all the data um, in like very shortly. This is the data that we have here today is a subset of that. It's just chromosome one. Um, yeah, so I think I'll switch over now and I'll just be around if there's any um, if there's any questions. I'll just be in the background. While we're switching over, does anybody have any questions for Mike? In, including like what is allelic, I totally missed that. I, I know it's not a common analysis, so I'm sure there'd be people in the room who haven't done it before. So if it, 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 very basic questions are totally welcome about allelic analysis or why, why you do this. Okay, so this workshop is on orchestra. If anybody wants to try to log in and follow along. Thank you, Mike, for the amazing introduction. So if you want to follow along the code, you can open up the R Studio right now. Um, so in this workshop, we have pre-packaged uh, two data set. As Mike has mentioned, it's the F1 osteoblast um, data set that is um, uh, short down to only chromosome one, and the one is on gene level, and the one is on um, transcribing, transcript starting set level. So first of all, we just want to explore like what the data set looks like. And here we first load up this uh, gene level data set uh, as a summarized experiment data set, and we can see that um, in the assay we have counts, abundance, and there's supposed to be length, and then 
in FRAPS 1 to 30s. And then that is the bootstrap replicate from uh, Salmon that is supposed to capture the inferential uncertainty. And the role name will be the gene name because we're looking at gene level. Uh, we can also look at the metadata. Uh, there are three pieces of information in their alleles, which A2 will be the reference here. That will be the black six. Um, and then A1 will be the alternative. It's either one to nine or cats. So we have two different cross over here. And then the day column capture the different time points. As Mike has mentioned, we have nine different time points from day two to day 18 every other day. Um, so why do we need, okay, let me just go down here and show you the SNM as I just described there, the read counts, the abundance calculated from TPM, and the length will be the transcript length averaged out um, of all the transcripts within the given gene. And then we have 30 different bootstrap replicates. We've, we think that 30 is a, is a good number because it doesn't take too long uh, to run in seven. And it also could do a pretty good job of capturing the uncertainty. And I had a question here that why do we need bootstrap replicates? And I feel like I just said to you guys that <laughs> it's used to capture uh, inferential uncertainty. So essentially when, uh, I think you guys are probably familiar with that, that when you um, doing the read mapping, a read could go to multiple places. It could go on different alleles, different transcripts, different genes. And especially when we're doing uh, allelic level isoform analysis, there are more options where this read can go. So this uncertainty of where exactly the read is mapped to will decrease um, the statistics, statistical power downstream. So hopefully uh, when we have 30 different bootstraps, it will be able to capture the variance of um, this uncertainty instead of if, if you just have one number, you might land on like the extreme side of this spectrum. So to visualize um, this bootstrap replicates, one option is to use the function gate trace and you can plot the histogram. So here we're uh, plotting the first um, genes in the, in the sample cast cross black six, day two of the reference allele. And you can see that it's not really, um, the histogram is not going very wide and kind of averaged out. And if you look at the mean and the variance of this count, you can see the mean and the variance are kind of close. Um, I can show you a not very close example. One sec. Okay, and here you can see that the estimated count is going from 100 to 350 instead of just like 80 to 120. And if you goes to mean and you can see the mean and variance are like not similar at all, since the bootstrap is following a Poisson distribution. So when the mean and variance is similar, we consider this uncertainty is pretty low. So this is an example of high certainty and the previous example is an example of kind of low uncertainty. And another can way I, of... I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Can I interrupt? Because that's a great... I didn't see that example yet, but that's fantastic because... So 129 is a another... Um, mouse strain it's too similar to black six that so that th there's more uncertainty because we can't tell the alleles apart that's a yeah so that's fantastic yeah thank you for that information i actually didn't know that <laughs> okay so another way of visualizing the bootstrap uh distribution will be using plot in wraps this is actually my favorite function fyi because i'm gonna show like a lot of this plot later on um so the way to um, show the bootstrap replicates is you just specify X alleles. So essentially you're telling the function that you want to group by alleles and then the left side will be reference allele and then the uh, right side will be the um, alter, alter alleles. And then if you see like the bar goes huge, it means this sample has a really big uncertainty during the mapping and then those small bars are just low, low uncertainty. Um, so this is an example of just grouping by alleles since we have multiple time points. And if you want a better visualization of how um, your sample does with um, time by alleles category, you can just um, specify covariance states. So here it, it is the same a similar piece of information, but categorized it differently. So the first um, call 
column you, it will be the alt allele and reference allele of day one for this uh, cast cross black six and then this second column will be um, the day four. Um, so in this particular way of plot in for v we're actually viewing days as a categorical variable and then in a scenario that you want to actually view it on a continuous scale, you need to compute inf rv first. So computing for rv essentially just compute uh, the mean and the variance of the bootstrap, and then you can um, plot the same way using the plot um, inf wraps function. And I highly recommend this shift x. So essentially, it shifts uh, your um, alt allele by right. Uh, right to point six to point two. So when you have two time points that are exactly the same, it won't overlap with each other. You can still see both of them on the same plot. So that's like a little trick that I would recommend to any researchers. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so after exploring the basic uh, how your data look like, we move on to filtering out the informative features. So in a scenario that when two alleles uh, have the exact same sequence, you wouldn't be able to identify um, where the reads go. So in a scenario like that, the bootstrap will have the exactly same counts for those alleles. So essentially, those features give us no information, and then we want to get those out of our data set. The way of doing that is you can just looking at one bootstrap. Here we are looking at the first bootstrap, and then we, um, so this one will be the um, count of first bootstrap for the out allele, and this one will be the reference allele. And then we are asking, are those counts the same for all the samples? If they are the same, we filter them out. So essentially, we're just keeping uh, all the features that don't have exactly same counts in all alleles. And we can see that we're filtering out like 50 uh, genes. So you might also want to uh, check the systematic bias of your data set. Um, so here we are plotting a rough log flow, uh, allylic log flow change uh, against the, the rough total counts. So the idea is if you don't have a systematic bias, the large counts um, LFC is supposed to center it at zero. And if you does, there will not be centered at zero. And another way of viewing it is you can plot uh, your allylic ratio. Um, and then here we're looking at the large counts um, alleles if the ratio is centered at 0.5. And the question for you is, what will we see if one of the parental genome and genotype was poorly annotated in terms of this histogram? Um, so when one of the parental genome was poorly annotated, uh, the reads will not be able to properly map to this poorly annotated genome. So in the scenario like that, we will see a shift in this um, rough ratio histogram. The red line or the mean will not be around 0.5. It will be like shifted. So that's a way, really good way to quickly check if there, if your data set is um, you expected essentially. So after we check um, some of the bias and filter out the informative features, and we move on to testing. So here we are using Swish, uh, which is developed and maintained by Dr. Mike Love and Enchi. I think I saw Enchi in the room as well. Um, so we're using Swish, which is um, I will use the sign Wilcox and sign rec test to compare alleles, and then we are introducing. I think I'm ahead of myself. Okay, first of all, let me just start with, we're switching to TSS level allelic uh, data instead of a gene level data because there are a few additional plots that um, we found particularly useful with TSS level uh, than gene level. So we're just gonna do uh, the filtering and then um, as we did before and the why do we think the TSS le level AI will be different from gene level AI? Uh, as Mike has mentioned before, that in some scenarios that allylic imbalance will be masked at gene level. So for example, if a gene had two different transcripts and the one is more abundant in out and the one is more abundant in 
um, reference, then at gene level, you will not be able to detect the lytic imbalance, but they actually exist in every transcript. Um, okay, so we move on running uh, to run switch. switch. Let me just get it started because it takes uh, a few seconds. So traditionally running switch ha has three different steps. The first one will be scaling the inferential replicates, and then you have to filter out the rows with inf insufficient counts, and then you calculate the statistics like log flow change and test st statistics, et cetera. Here we're skipping the scaling counts, step because essentially uh, since we're comparing alleles we're comparing within the same sample um, so to correct the sequen sequencing that the you are canceling out um, this number that you're using to correct it so we actually don't need to um, scale it in a scenario that we're testing allelic imbalance um, and here we're using lab label keep to flag all the features with a minimum count of 10 in at least three samples. So that's another filtering step. And then we compute inf RV as we described above. We're, we'll be performing two types of allelic imbalance testing. The first one is global AI for consistent allelic imbalance across all samples. So essentially the idea is, is um, global AI is you're pulling all the time points together and to test if there is exist a little imbalance overall. And then another testing is dynamic AI testing um, for non-zero correlation between the log allelic fold change and the continuous variable. So that one is you're testing if the correlation between the allelic fold change, and here we have time, if that correlation is significant, if the allelic ratio itself is changing over time. Okay, so here we're performing uh, the global test you only need to specify alleles, which is what you're trying to test, and the pair is they. So essentially, you're telling uh, the switch function that you're, you you want to compare the alleles within the same day so it doesn't get messed up. And then here is the function that used to test the dynamic AI. Uh, you have to additionally put covariance. So that is telling the system that you want to test the correlation of allelic flow change against this covariance. Uh, this variable day. And then for the correlation, we're using Spearson, but you can also uh, use Spearman if you want. Um, oh, that is the reason why we sp specified day twice in the dynamic, dynamic uh, analysis. So we can take a quick look of um, the results, how, uh, how, the, how significant are the TSS groups um, at 5% FDR set, and we can see there are a lot more global AI than dynamic AI. Um, so my take in this is since for the dynamic AI, you're testing the correlation. So you're adding additional layer to it. Not only their existence uh, allelic imbalance, this allelic imbalance needs to be changed with time. So that's just putting more criteria than just the global AI testing. And I want to show you really quick how um, the results look like. Oops. I'm not really used to this. Okay. So you have like many informations in um, this um, result essentially. So the TX ID is telling you since we're testing TSS groups, it tell it's telling you how what transcripts are grouped in this transcript group and then what genes it belongs to, and then the transcription starting site, the symbols. Um, and then you have all the test statistics like the uh, mean RV, log to flow change, p value, and q values. Okay. And then after we get the test results, most exciting uh, step is to plot your results and to see how uh, your data is doing. So we start with looking at uh, MA plot. So this is a global MA plot. Um, it is a very similar idea as. Um, the plot you, we were using to check the systematic bias, you're plotting the log to flow change against the log 10 mean. So here the log to flow change is um, better estimated than, than the previous one because here where the switch actually um, factor into the uh, 30 bootstrap replicates. So the inferential uncertainty was factored into the log to flow change calculated over here. So in this um, plot, the blues the blue dots are the significant AI global 
features. And then you can see when we have larger log to full change, usually those plots are flagged in blue, are flagged in, uh, significant. And then we can also view the same thing uh, for the dynamic AI, and then which agrees with the results we just saw that there are a lot less dynamic AI than the global AI. And then the reason that the extreme log to full change here are not flagged as significant is, uh, as I mentioned, that dynamic AI is actually testing the significance of correlation. Oh, and then you can specify, here we're testing 5% of DR set, but you can specify like uh, the threshold as you want. Okay, so um, to visualize the global and dynamic AI results, we recommend download Ensemble data, uh, data set from Annotation Hub. I've pre-downloaded it. If you're using this R Studio and when you're running this Annotation Hub step, it's gonna ask you to create a directory. You just say yes, and then it will download. Um, so we're introducing this new function called plot a lilac gene within fish pond. So what it does is it actually help you visualize um, the test results of one feature, um, which including the gene uh, gene model. Maybe I can move this one so it takes a little longer to. Okay, here. Uh, oh, there we go. So looking at this um, plot, we have gene over here that we are we're trying to um, exam. So we we put it in gene name, and it, but you can also use symbol name if you want. And then we also need the database. Here we are using Ensemble, but you can also use TXDB. Um, so this is the gene model that we extract from Ensemble database. And then I want to point out that the because the uh, resolution is not great. So the um, direction of the transcript are from right to left. And then we have six different transcripts over here and transcript one, three, uh, four, five, six are grouped together because the uh, starting site are uh, similar or same. And then transcript number two are its own group. And then first um, bar will be the negative log 10 Q values. And then we can see that both of them are actually pretty high in the Q values, pretty significant. And then the second bar is the log to full change. And we can actually, uh, look at the log to full change with the allylic proportion. So if we look at the first um, transcript group, we can see the cast is more abundant than the black six. So we see a positive log to full change over here. And then the uh, second transcript transcript group, we see the black six is a lot more abundant than cast. And then this we see a negative log to full change. And the last um, bar is isoform proportion that is also calculated from um, TPM. And then we can see, see, my guess is since we have like uh, five different transcript groups in this transcript group, and then this uh, transcript group will be more abundant over here. So we can verify what we see in plot allylic gene with plot info in our V reps. And one thing is in Plot inf, our inf wraps only takes index, so we kind of have to grab the index from uh, the summarized the data set. Uh, and we renamed the label so it shows black six and cast instead of just A1 and A2. Um, so here we're essentially looking at, um, so samples over here will be um, different days of cast um, samples. And here the left, the y-axis is samples. And it very it is showing um, the transcript group over here. So the solo transcript group, which in plot allylic gene we have cast is more abundant than B6. And then in the uh, plot in wraps plot, you can still see the cast is more abundant than black six, which kind of verify and agrees with which we saw in the previous plot. And then another new plot that we are introducing today is plot allylic heat map. So uh, this function itself will call a uh, heat map. The one, um, so this is the same as the plot inf wrap plot that you have to grab the index from the summarized experiment. And then the only tr additional work that you have to do is you have to um, call, grab the Q value itself from the summarized the data after running swish. And then we kind of customize the label over here to better 
visualize the day. Um, so when there's more red, it means the out is more abundant. And then when it's uh, blue, the um, reference is more abundant. And then the green bar over here is uh, the greener, the more significant Q value you got over here. Um, so that is for the global AI. And then the same set of function can also be used to um, visualize dynamic AI. And then I personally like the plot in uh, wraps the best for the dynamic AI because you get this really neat um, trend with time plot. So what you do is you first plot inf wraps again, recommend shifting it a little bit, and then you um, essentially you line it up, which gives you a better visualization on the trend. And then here you can see that the black six is changing over time, but cast is not. So that means this allelic ratio is definitely changed over time for this gene and this transcript, transcript group. And then within the same gene, let's look at the other transcript group. Here, both um, CAS and Black 6 are increasing, but we can see like um, from day six to day eight, uh, CAS is actually increasing much more quickly than Black 6, which also indicating a change um, in allelic ratio with time. And here's the question is, what do you notice with the two inf RV plot hint? Is the allelic imbalance in the same direction? It's kind of hard to fit them in. It's not. So this one is, uh, the uh, black six is much more abundant in the first one, and the cast is much more abundant in the second one. Um, so plot allelic gene can also be used to visualize time series allelic imbalance data. Um, but the difference between uh, dynamic, dynamic AI and global AI is here we need to bring the time points together um, because we have nine different time points we would not be able to fit them in one plot just not enough room um, so here we bring day two to day six day eight to day 12 and day 14 to day 18 together so uh, the strategy to bring the time points could either be depend on your biological motivation or actually look at the plot in 4 v wraps to maximize the difference in this scenario. So let's run this. Okay. Here we actually have just two different transcripts, but interestingly, they're uh, doing, they're going different directions in the, in the allelic ratio. You can see for, let's just call this one, the first one, the black six is increasing over time. Um, but the cast is decreasing over time, but on um, the the other transcript group, the cast is increasing over time and black is decreasing over time, which also agrees with the plot uh, in FRAP plot we were seeing. Uh, the good thing about uh, in FRAP plot is if there's uh, not many transcript groups in this gene, you can plot them in the same plot, which is a really good visualization to compare to two transcripts. However, if you, uh, some genes, they have multiple transcript groups. If you have like four or five, it's going to be really hard to fit uh, them all in, in one plot with uh, plot inf wraps. And then it will, um, in this scenario, plot allelic ratio might be a better idea, but I actually think uh, the heat map will be the most uh, suitable for a scenario like that if you have if if you want to view visualize your results uh, across multiple samples and the multiple um, transcripts so the difference between global AI and dynamic AI in terms of heat map is we are adding this time bar over here so the way to add time bar is quite easy you just uh, essentially just build a data frame that extracted the time variable out of your um, results. And then we are also customi customize the label here, it's saying the time, but if you have multiple samples, you can actually customize it saying different things. And then it will be a lot easy to visualize this heat map, if, especially if you have multiple transcripts. Here we only have two, but if you have multiple, it will be like much easier to visualize with heat map. Um, so that's it for the code demo itself. And a few uh, takeaway or not takeaway, like um, clarification is first of all, we found that um, 
with Seesaw, it's very hard to fit all the information in one plot because we have many layers of information. There is isoforms, uh, alleles, different time points, and there's many measurements. Um, there are uncertainty, and then there's test statistics. So we recommend you explore different um, plots because we don't think any one of the plot will be able to capture uh, any information. So we also recommend you look at uh, line reads. We looked a few in IGV and um, we, you can also view them in other genome browser. And then that's a good way to examine the distribution of the reads. And also, as Mike has mentioned here, we're uh, primarily motivated by examining transcript groups that um, has allelic imbalance because of the uh, cis regulatory elements, but the same concept can be uh, applied to uh, to group the transcripts based on your own biological motivations. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my amazing advisor, Dr. Mike Love, uh, our collaborator from Osteoblast, and uh, um, Salmon, and the financial support. I'm happy to take questions too. Thank you. Anybody in the room have questions? Okay. There's, if you haven't been logged in, there's a really long, good conversation going on in the online chat. I'll see if I can copy it and put it somewhere because it's, there are not really any result, unresolved questions in there. Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. Can you go back to the very first? box plot figure that you showed, the one you said you really liked. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was wondering, so it looks like there's sort of two groups of samples, ones that are really variable and then ones that are have a pretty tight distribution. Do you know what what's going on there? Just give it back. She's got to answer. Okay, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. I actually think that corresponding to the information Mike was just saying that we have two different crosses. We have uh, one to nine cross black six, which one to nine black six are more closely related and then cast cross black six, which are more uh, distinguishable. So when you see a very, I think when you see like this high variables is we're looking at one to nine cross black six because the sequence, the alleles are less likely to be distinguished. So you have the bootstrap uh, replicates capture more uncertainty instead of uh, when you have very different sequences with cast and black six, it's a lot easier for like just less certainty in that. Does that, is that correct? Okay, I think it's correct. <laughs> Thank you for the question though. Um, so on the very last heat map that you presented, um, I think I just missed, what was the significance of adding that time bar at the beginning? Because I know the previous heat map also tracked changes over the days. Um, I actually think that uh, here we're, since we only have one variable that is time, but if you want, if you have multiple samples that capture different information, if you like not only label just by days, you can you can change the samples over here and add a time bar. So that's like two layers, two different layers of information in there. But here we only, since we only have one, so it's kind of like repetitive. Yeah. Um, yeah, th thanks for uh, both of you for the uh, for this workshop. There's a lot that I I think flew a little bit over my head because um, um, I don't work in this area. But uh, um, what I'm trying to understand in my mind is like you have these two groups of samples because of the two alleles. Um, how does this compare against, let's say, if you um, compute the mean and, um, and variance and just divide it to, right? Um, now you have a single curve for a particular um, isoform and you could use maybe the, some of the methods we saw earlier at BIOC, like trend catcher or like trendy and find um, those where there's a, those isoforms where there's a significant trend. Um, 
or maybe the difference, maybe there's a, um, a trend on the significant difference between the, sorry, a, a significant trend for the difference between the two groups of samples. Um, how would that compare against what you're doing? I actually not sure if I understand it correctly. Uh, are you referring to the dynamic AI? We just calculate or Mike, do you have any input? I guess one thing that's unique about um, this analysis versus like um, finding trends in gene expression is the, um, the covariance structure across isoforms and alleles is really complicated. And so um, we're doing a non-parametric test to avoid any kind of parametric assumption on that, but like there is all kinds of uncertainty across isoforms and alleles, and it's hard to like compress it to a summary statistic and just use like a spline or something. So yeah. Um, if you can collapse it to a level where there's no more uncertainty, then you could like throw away the uncertainty and use and use a point estimate and like go do a spline with that. But at this point, it's too like at the level shown on the screen now, there's just so much uncertainty and the distributions are not well behaved. They're like they're like spike at zero and then a long tail like they're very nasty. And so we don't make any parametric assumptions on that. I have a question. This is Ryan. Um, could you use a similar statistical model to um, analyze the ratio between spliced and unspliced transcripts? I haven't thought about that. Obviously, the the the, the null hypothesis would not be 0.5, but other than that. Um, the, um, I, that might be more complicated. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say like, yeah, use it. <laughs> I think it's more complicated. We, the nice thing about the alleles is like, there's just a single SNP difference. Whereas the difference between an unspliced and a spliced transcript and the counts you get has all kinds of biases. Like, I don't know, there's a bunch of, there's a couple papers right now about the, like, there's one from, um, Albert Quo and, and uh, Casper and Stephanie right now on BioArchive about all the biases that affect the unspliced versus spliced counts. Here, we assume that there's no real bias difference between the allele counts because there's only a single letter change. Okay, I guess we'll do one last one um, from online from either, I'm not sure it's pronounced Thady or Taddy. Uh, for example, on day one, gene X is expressed at 10, uh, three from A1 and some from A2. But on day 10, gene X is expressed at 20, 10 from A1 and 10 from A2. How could you quantify the contribution to gene expression changes from changes in A1 and A2? What is that? <laughs> I can Here, look can at Yeah. Why don't they? For example, on the one drugs expressed at 10, 3 from A1, 7, on day 10, genes expressed 20, 10 from A1, 10 from. How could you quantify the contribution to gene expression changes? I think at each time point, for example, on day one, when you have this allylic imbalance, 3 from A1, 7 from A2, you have a little like ratio at day one, and then on day ten, you like the allylic ratio is gone, and then this changes can actually first of all be captured use the infrared um, plot, and then if you use the dynamic AI testing, it should be able to capture um, this change you are referring to. If that answers your question. All right, with that, let's give another thanks to a good presentation by Yuffie and Mike. All right. We spilled a little bit over, but we now have a break until 3.30. So we'll see you all at the next one.